So one of our goals for this class is to take a look at the history of the city. The city has its own institution. The city is an entity. Some 82% of us today in this country live in cities, large and small. That's a huge percentage of our population. That means less than 20% of us, less than 20% of us live in places where we regularly have traffic jams, we have lots of options with regard to shopping, and materials, groceries, etc. The rest of us, less than 20% of us in this country, we live in places where we have to drive a long way to get to a grocery store, to get to a doctor, to get to a school. We may have well water instead of water supplied by our taxpaying dollars. We might have, we hope we have electricity, or at least some kind of access to it, but we may have had to pay for that ourselves. So most of us, in this country at least, live in a situation where we take a lot of those basic utilities for granted. In the rest of the world, just barely over 50% of the Earth's population lives in cities. So the U.S. is pushing the numbers in that statistic far faster, far greater than the rest of the world. Some of you may say, oh well, that doesn't make us better. I'd much rather live in the countryside than live in the city with all of its attendant problems, even though there are certainly some advantages to it. You're right. So let's take a look at the city itself. Let's take a look at the history of the city and how that has come to be. Again, we said in the U.S., 82% of us live in cities. When this country was founded by Europeans, that statistic was not anything like that, yeah? Most people lived in the countryside. Most people considered living in towns something uh, unusual. Very few people lived in the towns. You visited town on the weekend, maybe to go to church. You visited the town once every 10 days, maybe to do uh, some trading, go to market. So things have changed dramatically in this country, dramatically in the world. We are an urban people. How did we get there? Most historians see urban living as a part of the recipe for civilization, and it's an integral part of the history of civilization itself. Civilization has often been defined with a list of characteristics. Chief among them is the ability to support an urban environment, a city center, if you will. The basic recipe for those of you maybe who have been in my civ classes know that we need an agricultural uh, element, we need to be able to practice agriculture, we need animal husbandry such that we are raising our own food, raising our own crops, uh, domesticating our animals for food and for labor. We also seem to find in most early civilizations some kind of religious institutions, either an individual or a set of rituals or even places designated somehow as sacred. We'll find a fine political authority someone who's in charge, or some group that's in charge, some process to create a leader, some process to take a leader out. So we will find that in civilization. Trade. Typically, agricultural and uh, other kinds of surplus lead folks to want to trade with others who don't have the kind of surplus, say, civilization A has, uh, but maybe civilization B has certain things that you'd like to trade for that you don't have the ability to produce as easily. Other elements of civilization, writing. Historians want to see a society writing. And usually when we find a city in antiquity, we find written records being kept. A defined social hierarchy. That may sound like just another element of a sociology class, sure, but a social hierarchy in an early civilization and in a city is often defined by wealth or maybe a responsibility or even power. Right? So those who typically have the most wealth also have the most responsibility. Those who typically have the most responsibility also have the most power in a society. Most of our early civilizations and our early cities have evidence of military force, either for defense or for maintaining order within the civilization, within the city itself. We're also going to see monumental architecture. We're going to see great building projects. We've seen a few images of those. We'll see more. Many historians talk about material complexity, uh, the ability to work metals, the ability to work out complex mathematic problems, say, for your irrigation works, for um, taxation, for 
uh, preparing for the future, for organizing large numbers of people. Urban living, for sure, you find on this list. But cultural identity, that's something we're seeking in this class as well. Whether that identity is defined by your language, your religion, the stories you tell, the technology you have acquired, whatever that may be, your cultural identity is something we'll be looking for. Most cities, most early civilizations have something rather unique about them that sets them apart culturally. We have lots of examples from early civilization. We'll be focusing in on a few in this class from the early world, early antiquity. Uh, but we can always, we can never forget Mesopotamia. This is ancient Iraq. Um, some of you have seen images and pictures, of course, but the, they have, as some of our examples are wanting, great monumental building, things like ziggurats. Uh, these are mud brick edifices that are stepped, pyramid-shaped things, right, uh, that have multiple levels to them. Sometimes they look like a mountain, uh, some might say, uh, but ultimately wider at the bottom, narrower at the top, going as high as they can make them. Also from ancient Mesopotamia, we have the Law Code of Hammurabi, the first law code in antiquity that is written that tries to create order, tries to establish a central authority in a king who claims that his laws come from a god, so connecting both religion and politics there. We also have from Mesopotamia, the first city-states of Mesopotamia, uh, great literature and storytelling. In particular, some of you have struggled with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, a great heroic warrior, part god, part man. He liked to fight lions. He uh, slew monsters and brought back resources for his city. He was a great king. So the Epic of Gilgamesh, great epic literature, Hammurabi's Law Code, uh, the idea of trying to establish an understanding of authority and to bring some order into a particular city or civilization, and then great building projects such as ziggurats, I have an example here of the Great Mosque of Samara. Now this is a mosque, right? But it has the similar features of a ziggurat in that it is mud brick and it has layers going up. Some have suggested it's, it's akin to the biblical Tower of Babel. So ancient city-states of Mesopotamia, ancient Iraq, these are the city-states of Ur, Uruk, or the biblical Erech, Nineveh, names that you may know from your Bible readings uh, or from your World Civ I classes. Greece also, of course, a uh, civilization very famous for its city-state approach to political order. You can't really, just as in ancient Iraq, in ancient Greece you can't really find a great country of Greece in antiquity. You find a collection of city-states. I've suggested you think about uh, Athens, Eretria, Olympia, your readings are going to take you here. Antigone, the play by Sophocles, was written and performed in Athens. It relates to the city-state of Thebes, which is another story. We'll get there. Eretria, you have from your readings, the uh, great parade, religious procession of the um, Artemisia, that is a religious procession. We have great detailed records of that, this great city parade or procession for religious purposes. And then, of course, Olympia. We have an example in your readings from the Olympic Games. So um, monumental building in Greece as well, things like the Parthenon in Athens, great storytelling. This will happen in the theater of Dionysus and elsewhere. Religious processions, I suggested, with Artemisia, which we'll read about, religious festivals and competitions, in particular the Olympic Games. These beautiful women, these uh, caryatids, they're called, these columns that support a building on the Acropolis at Athens are one of the examples of monumental art and architecture and the great complexity that can be achieved in some of this art. Of course, the Parthenon. We'll also get to Rome. When I think of Rome, I often think of water. The Romans were terrific at bringing water into their city. We said before that most cities in this country in particular have a reliable water supply. Your tax dollars go to it. And people living in a city, would, some people still rely on well water and would prefer that, but 
if nothing else, the city and its taxes ought to provide clean drinking water. The Romans thought this too, and they were phenomenal at getting in uh, water through aqueducts. This was an engineering marvel of the day. And not only for getting water into the city, but getting wastewater out. And then also uh, having lots of fountains around the city for public use. The Romans, when you think of the Romans, you also think about a great military. Uh, they not only use that military for defense, for keeping order, but also for expansion. And so when we think of the great city-state of Rome, we often also think of the Roman Empire that expanded all across the Mediterranean. Both of these attributes contribute to the culture of that city. Gladiator games and other great spectacles we have to look at in this class, uh, in particular, happened at the Colosseum. Don't forget religion at Rome as well, another institution of great cities, in that the Vatican, during the Christian era at Rome, comes to be a city of its own, a city in the middle of the city of Rome, but somehow separate and independent, yes? Having its own resources, system of defense, political authority, resources, etc., on and on. This is a model created for the city of Rome, what it might have looked like in the first century AD. By the time this was a reality, Rome had a population of over a million people. Quite a feat for a city in antiquity that did not have electricity or GPS. This is an example of uh, Roman aqueducts. Now these are up in Paris, sorry, sorry, outside Paris. These are in France. But a good, a good example of the engineering capability of the Romans to move water along these uh, structures here. The water uh, moved through pipes on top of these arches to get where the Romans wanted it to go. And of course the Colosseum. We're going to fast forward to London. London was founded by the Romans in the first century BC, but over time, you know, it grew without Roman influence and came to be one of the most important cities, not only in England, but in Europe as a whole. We're going to focus on the times of Shakespeare. We're going to focus on London at that time, and that's right at the turn of around 1600. It's the time of Elizabeth I. It's the time of the Renaissance, and England starting to begin to have her own empire. So this is England right on the verge of becoming something like Rome, London right on the verge of becoming something like the, the center of the universe, the center of the world. I mentioned that the Romans were terrific with their, their water. When I think of London, I think of the River Thames, and I think of all the bridges that span that river so that people can move across that river uh, cars today can move across that river. Uh, the other thing I think about with London is that, that relates to our class is lots of gardens. The English and the British in particular like, like gardens. They like parks. They like to be able to have ordered greenery in the midst of the hustle and bustle of the city. Today London is a city of well over 8 million people, but they cherish their parks tremendously. Also museums. Museums. Now museums aren't new with London. Other cities had them, in ancient cities particularly, but uh, London has today some of the most spectacular museums in the world, all of them free, all of them supported by tax de taxpayer do dollars, uh, but all of them free and open to anyone who wants to come in and view these treasures. You've seen this map before. Again, this is uh, London around 1600, where we'll be focusing. And you can see, if you go below the River Thames, if you go south, all of these amazing theaters, the, the, uh, the Swan, the Bull Ring, the First Bear Garden, the Rose, the Hope, the Globe, all of these great theaters just outside the city limits. There were some good legal reasons for that. We'll get to it. But still, just across the bridge, London Bridge, from the main part of the city itself. We'll also take a look at New York. I don't have to tell you that New York City, uh, the largest city in this country today, with a population well over 8 million, pushing upwards towards 9 million today, I think, uh, it is the economic center of our country. It features extraordinary cultural exchange, which all major cities throughout time would have done, not only having their own cultural identity, but having themselves open to other peoples coming and going. You might want to trade there. A really vibrant theater and music scene, of course, in New York, very famous for that as well. 
uh, that not only entertains the people who live in that city, but encourages tourism and people to come from outside the city to spend money there. A lot of those theaters are indeed supported through tax breaks by the city of, of New York as people hope to create an industry, an economic industry, out of that cultural reality. Professional sports, let's don't forget those. Uh, absolutely, the Mets versus the Yankees, the Yankees versus the Mets, we can't forget it. That gives this city, again, its own identity. Madison Square Garden, a great venue for uh, not only sporting events, but concerts as well. So the uh, city of New York, an extraordinarily vibrant place with its own culture, its own character. And again, I have to throw in there that it's a walking city. You, of course, have lots of great mass transportation in, in New York, lots of public transit, but pretty much if one has the time and knows where they're going, the uh, walking the city is probably one of the best ways to see it even today. We've been talking about monumental architecture, iconic images, art. And there is something to be said for great statuary, great art that offers an image, a symbol of the city. When you see this, I'm sure you think Statue of Liberty, you think freedom. Perhaps in, in a post 9-11 war, you think defiance, survival. So this idea of the Statue of Liberty given to us by the French as a gift commemorating our connection through the American Revolution and the French Revolution this Statue of Liberty on Ellis Island, the island of immigration, has so much meaning to so many people, not only in New York, but throughout the world. Again, Times Square turning into a, a entertainment mecca for all over the world, but certainly one of the distinguishing identifiable features of New York City itself. We'll also talk a little bit about New Orleans. We have an article by uh, Mary Ryan who features the, the idea of the parade and how it's a uniquely American part of uh, an, a uniquely American art form, a uniquely American expression of culture in a city. Uh, we have that, but we also have the discussion of the New Orleans Superdome. And so when you think New Orleans, you think great street parties, the great parades, but you also think great teams like the New Orleans Saints and of course um, recovery from natural disaster, recovery from Katrina, something to think about in all this, but also this culture that is New Orleans. Uh, it relates to New Orleans music, to the food, again to the outdoor living featured in the uh, French Quarter and other places in New Orleans. This is the rebuilt New Orleans Superdome, sponsored, as you can see, by Mercedes-Benz. The cathedral in New Orleans. The city center is also the religious center. Something never changed there. We'll also take a look at San Francisco. And again, San Francisco in our own culture, a uh, fabulous town, a very European style town on the American coast, the American West Coast, uh, associated with the American frontier days, also with uh, the gold rush days, a little north of, of most of that gold rush in California, but still very much important part of that. Uh, named for St. Francis, San Francisco, or San Francisco is, is a great city in and of itself for religion. Uh, the Jesuits came here and made a tremendous impact, staking out parts of the city center to make sure that their church was accessible to all who came through. I also think of, and you may too, of San Francisco and its bridges connecting it to uh, the various places there in Northern California, the very centers of population. And finally, I suppose I think of San Francisco and the Pacific Rim. Uh, as almost, we always think of San Francisco as the far, one of the farthest west points in this country, but it is also a gateway to Asia, a gateway to the Pacific. Uh, and, and in that regard, opens us up to more influences from Asian cultures. So if we can get to Wichita, 
Wichita, I think, and you can go down the list, and I've tried to, to come up with as many as I can. If you look for the basics of a city, what's the important things of a city? What's the important things of a city culture? Uh, what does it mean to be civilized? Uh, how does urban living play into that? If you look at Wichita and it put it into the formula, put Wichita into the recipe, economically, we probably started off as a cattle town. We have lots of rivers converging here, so there's good resources here, not only for uh, water resources and farming, but also to water cattle, if you will. Uh, so we're a good place for cattle and agriculture, but as you know, in the past several decades or more, uh, Wichita has been known as an air capital. Those economic issues change, come and go, but given our connection to McConnell Air Force Base, we're always going to have, so long as we have that base, this interesting connection between uh, the economic sector of Wichita and the military sector that is federal, right? So that's the city coming together with the national. We also have a deep-seated sense of religion in this community. That's probably a, a hallmark of our culture. It's probably something about what it means to be a Wichita. You know we have the center of the Wichita, the, the diocese here for the Catholic Church and then a significant number of churches in the community. When I first moved here some 15 years ago, the uh, Wichita Tourism Board told me that there were more churches per capita, more churches per person in Wichita than in any other place in the country. I don't know if that still holds true, but it doesn't surprise me. I live at the corner of Maple and Martinson, and at the corner of Maple and Martinson I have um, a uh, evangelical church on one corner that used to be a Methodist church. I've got a Syrian Orthodox church just across the street. Uh, down the road, not not half a block, is uh, a Catholic uh, convent. And then uh, directly across the street from me, um, a retirement home of folks who uh, are the Masons and while that's not an organized religion of sorts, it is a benevolent society based in Christianity. So, or at least as I understand it, some of you may have different ideas. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting that Wichita is a center of religion. Education. We're known well for our education. We've got several universities in town uh, who are, that are based here. And then we also have perhaps uh, the model of the diocesan Catholic school system that is envied by many, many people in the country. Uh, we have a system that works very well, uh, prepares young people well for college, prepares them well uh, for life in general. So a uh, great source of education here. Also, we have an interesting cultural identity that we would associate with the Wichita tribes, with, but also with immigration, not only of European immigration, but uh, Latin American immigration and now Asian immigration. So um, a very interesting cultural identity here in Wichita, Kansas. Let's can't, we can't forget theater. We also have an extraordinary number of theater opportunities here in Wichita. I'm sure you know this from little theater, community theater, to university theater, to opera, ballet, symphony, and then of course Broadway uh, legitimate theater. We've, we've got the professional theater here as well. So we're quite an amazing um, entertainment area. We have large entertainment venues. We've got the Wichita Interest Arena. We've got the Coliseum. Uh, and we've got uh, Hartman Arena. We've also got the Convention Center downtown. So we have lots of large-scale venues for entertainment. We also have lots of small-scale venues as well. Professional sports, well, minor league teams, yes. Uh, both in hockey and in baseball, and college sports, particularly in the past couple of years, have gotten really hot with basketball. Uh, not long before that, we were very, uh, very, very excited about baseball in this town. The Wichita baseball team having won, men's baseball having won the College World Series. So we have um, a lot going on with regard to uh, all of the ideas that we've been talking about that relate to the idea of a city. So when you're thinking about the major issues, economics, politics, um, entertainment, religion, monumental building, um, oh gosh, defense, all of the main issues that we talked about that make a civilization that come together in a city, education, Wichita has all of that. Uh, other public venues that I've put up here, the uh, botanical gardens, the... Um, images of the Wichita River Festival, and then also, of course, 
uh, the iconic image of the Keeper of the Plains and this in a uh, use of fireworks. So I hope that this uh, walk through the city in history, this idea of taking a look at what it takes to uh, have a civilization, agriculture, religious institutions, political authority, trade, writing, social hierarchy, military forces, monumental architecture, material complexity, whatever that might be, cultural identity and urban living, that we've been able to establish that these are some key features of how people come together, what happens when they do come together, the kind of institutions they form, right? And how these institutions started off very small in the history of the world, started off very small. When we first began coming together as peoples, living together in settled areas, most of us stayed on the farm and rarely came to town. These days, the opposite is the case. So the city living that began three, four thousand years ago, that's one institution from the ancient world that we have not given up on. We like it, we continue it, more and more of us every year have decided to take up urban living.